Okay. I'd like to call this finance committee meeting to order. The first item we have an assignment for request for council action. Okay. We have for the finance committee 1662 request for track funding for state route 18 corridor approval project 1663 fiscal year 2016 chip grant partnership agreement and CT consultant agreement. 1664 amend CCF Banana Hospital and MRCR Health and Fitness Agreement. 1665 change order fiscal year 14 chip 3556 Jared Gerald Boulevard Brunswick 1666 <coughs> copy purchase 1667 bids West Smith Road reconstruction 1668 bids 2016 concrete street repair 1669 amending ordinance 1215 friends of the cemetery lease agreement 1670 construct six foot wide sidewalk along, along Ryan Road 1671, amending planning and zoning code, various tax amendments. 1672, expenditure over 15,000, commercial fitness solutions, MCRC. And 1673, bicentennial pavers. Item number two is the bicentennial committee update. And we have Roger Smalley here to give us an update. Roger. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. Um, back in uh, the spring of uh, 2014, uh, Mayor Hanwell recognizing the uh, wouldn't be too long before the city would be celebrating its 200th anniversary in 2018. Put together a committee of local citizens and uh, we had our first meeting on July 7, 2014. Uh, we've been meeting uh, ever since uh, in the first couple years, uh, focusing on uh, the events, the kind of things we'd like to see uh, presented to the, uh, well, made available really, to the community. Uh, and we've come up with a pretty good list of those and uh, begun to flesh those out so we have a pretty good idea of how we're going to do them and uh, what all is involved. Um, this year uh, we've picked up the pace. Uh, we are meeting uh, every other month to hold a full committee. And we have four subcommittees and they meet in the off uh, sometimes more than once. And those committees are working on fundraising. Mr. Lamb is chairing that committee. Uh, publicity and memorabilia, uh, getting the word out about all the events, that committee will make sure we do that, as well as uh, recommending items uh, that will be for sale to celebrate the Bicentennial uh, throughout, uh, even beginning uh, in 2017. Uh, events and marketing, um, the events that are a little bit uh, specific, uh, some of those events we're going to not completely reinvent the wheel. Uh, we'll, we'll partner with some of the existing events uh, that Main Street is doing, as well as other organizations in the community throughout 2018. Um, and then we have the History and Education Committee as well, because it is a celebration of 200 years. And we have an awful lot of our history uh, that we want to be able to share with the community in a lot of different ways. So uh, that's the basic structure of how we're going about all this. Um, Currently, we have about 20 people on the entire full committee. Uh, most of those are very active, um, and they're broken down into these four subcommittees. And I can, I'll be glad to go through and give you an idea of what we're looking at or how we're structuring all this, what's anticipated. I don't know exactly what all you'd like to know, but uh, I can give you a, a little idea. synopsis of that would be great, just so we have a sure. idea. Uh, well, I can I can get you something in writing if you'd like that. That's no problem. No, no, we don't need anything in writing. Just okay. give us a. Okay. <laughs> well, we have uh, we have about 40 events planned right now. It's each month there's three or four events that happen. Uh, we're planning a major homecoming event uh, the week of July 4th, 2018, beginning on the 4th of July and going through uh, July 11th. Uh, July 11th happens to be the annual gathering of all Medina alumni, Medina High School alumni. Uh, they have had have been out of school for 50 years or more. So we know we're going to have hundreds of people coming back for that event and we're going to try and expand uh, getting the word out to many of the graduates of Medina High School uh, during the course of leading up to all this. Um, So that'll be our, our major event in the summer. Um, of course, we'll have the regular 4th of July parade, but that'll also be the Bicentennial Parade. And uh, we hope to get, hope that's a, a great one that has the community very involved with lots of floats, uh, 
all the various groups and organizations in, in town, as well as uh, things from the committee itself. Uh, get the bands to play, hopefully, and, uh, which is not the normal case for the 4th of July, but uh, we're going to do that. Um, we're, and then, of course, the band concert, fireworks, uh, all would all happen. The 4th is on a Wednesday, so we're looking at spreading those events out Thursday and Friday. Uh, over the weekend, we plan on bringing a carnival into town for Saturday and Sunday uh, with the hopes of including a Ferris wheel so in front of the courthouse so that people can get up and actually look down on the, the whole area of the historic district and, and further out. And uh, we have a number of leads on carnivals that may do it for free as long as they can sell tickets. So we'll have to see how that goes. Um, we're planning uh, some uh, showings in the park of old uh, footage of Medina. Uh, we have quite a bit of video footage, surprisingly, uh, that we can share with the community as well as some old movies. We have home movies from a number of local families. Uh, the Gibbs family, the Roots have uh, home footage. So we're looking at trying to do something in the evening uh, probably on Monday or Tuesday of that following week, <laughs> celebrating uh, Medina's uh, heritage in that homecoming week. Uh, but we're going to kick things off, actually, in November of 2017 at the Candlelight Walk Parade. We'll have our first float uh, about the bicentennial then, uh, because Medina actually became uh, a community on November 30th of, 20, of 1818. So by starting in November, we'll have a full year, really, of celebration and activities. Um, we're going to talk to uh, Castle Noel about doing something about Santa's uh, in relation to uh, some of the history and things uh, and with that. January will be uh, focused on our Pioneer Heritage. We have a number of history programs that are scheduled for that. Uh, February, we're going to tie into Black History Month. Um, there is no separate standalone history of the black community in Medina. But we have a group of African American women working on that right now. They have access to uh, a whole trove of uh, photographs of the black community taken by uh, local black photographers. And uh, we're working with them to try and get that together uh, so that we can fill in that piece of Medina's history uh, that we are lacking. And uh, that will all be a part of, hopefully, a uh, presentation of that will be a part of what we do for the Bicentennial in February. March, uh, we want to focus on the contributions that women have made to Medina. And they are extensive. <coughs> um, and uh, we have quite a group of uh, women to talk about historically. And we also want to invite Medina's women to today to, to share what they're doing and get involved in uh, recognize their efforts. In April, uh, the Civil War, Donna played a pretty important part from the standpoint of volunteers and some leaders. And of course, uh, we also want to focus on the fires that kind of shaped Medina's history uh, in the month of April as well. That's the year, the month that we had two of our largest fires, or it was in April. In May, uh, we want to bring the veterans groups in uh, and make the Memorial Day parade something a little different, more special. Uh, and talk about not only the service of our of our veterans uh, throughout the, in the centuries, but also uh, how people lived and reacted on the home front, um, what the citizens did during uh, so many of the wars that uh, were fought here in our country and Medina residents were part of. <coughs> June, uh, the community band uh, will begin, and we're going to ask them to do kind of some special programming throughout their season. Uh, Kids Day of Play, we've got a whole bunch of old time games uh, that we're going to try, we're going to plug into uh, that. Uh, maybe not mumbledy pegs where you have to use a knife, but uh, some other kinds of things jacks and marbles and uh, jump rope and balsa planes and different kinds of races. Uh, Back in the Susquehanna Centennial, they had a pie-eating contest that we have footage of. It was pretty interesting. So we may see, we may get, if we get enough pies, then we might do that. Uh, Pizza Palooza, uh, we're going to open the, the idea of community uh, cookbook, or at least recipes from our local residents, 
uh, to share and put into some kind of a, a bicentennial cookbook. So that'll be a part of that. July, the homecoming week, uh, we're going to work with the arts organizations during Art Week to try and do some additional things for the bicentennial. Originally, the county fair was located in the Uptown Park. So we're going to have a little mini fair before the real fair starts now and uh, try to bring in animals. Um, I'll have to talk to Jansen about the cleanup on that, but uh, uh, at least uh, do some things uh, that uh, will be a part of uh, the fair as well. Uh, in August, uh, we're going to focus on growth of the community in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, we more than double our population in those two year, in two decades, and then of course we did it again in the next two decades. So uh, that early growth, there were a lot of challenges uh, for government and the community. We want to talk about that. Uh, we're going to look into the transportation and the development of that in our community from some of the earliest roads. Uh, Worcester Pike was in 1824. Uh, people were already traveling on Worcester Pike, and of course the interurban. Uh, very unique system. Focus on that. And plug into the International Festival in, uh, in August as well. And try and tie the Genealogy Society in with that so that people can do some research right there on the square. September, uh, we already have Spirits of the Past, and we're going to focus on that as our event. Uh, we're looking at maybe a hot air balloon uh, um, festival, either at the uh, fairgrounds or at the well, they're not real wild about the idea at the, at the airport, but maybe at the fairgrounds you can do something with that. And uh, we're also going to focus on the history of Medina City Schools. Uh, Gloria Brown has uh, written a wonderful book that has never been published, and we're in process now of trying to get that done. Uh, we already have some funding for it, and uh, that will be a nice addition, once again, filling another historical niche that we don't have information on. Complete information. October will be celebrating the restoration of the square in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, manufacturing and industry will be celebrated in Medina. Uh, we have many industries. If you go back and look at the 18th or the 1966 history of Medina, they had a whole section on industries in Medina, and it's amazing how many are still here. They were there in 1966. And we want to celebrate that. We want to invite those industries to come and tell their stories in a variety of ways because uh, they've been a huge part of our community for a long time. Um, November then, we'll wrap things up uh, with a look at Medina as it is today. Uh, we're hoping to put together a book uh, that will include a lot of photos of the way things look now because 50 years from now, People are going to want to know, how did Medina look way back there in 2018? Mm -hmm. you know, so we want to make sure that they have those resources just like we've had the resources uh, from the 1800s. And uh, so that, that's a piece of that. Candlelight Walk, uh, we're going to talk about Medina as in our sense of place, uh, what the community offers, um, our quality of life, really focus on Medina today. and. A celebration of what we are, at that at least what we will be in 2018. And we thought we'd finish it up with a kind of a dinner dance uh, on November 30th. Um, just and whoever wants to come, we'll make it a nice closing celebration. So that's kind of what we're doing. Um, we've got a rough estimate that this will run about $150,000. Um, we think that's doable. Uh, a lot of these things are small items that local families could, could fund. You know, if we have a, a lecture at the library and we want some refreshments, $100 goes a long way. And so we can begin to get a lot of sponsorships. And we think that local businesses and other groups may want to step up and help with uh, the funding as well. So that's really the focus for this year is to, one, to try and get our major donors online. Uh, and also to begin to get in contact with all these groups throughout the city to let them know what we're planning. And then uh, next year we'll, we'll nail down, or even at the end of this year, begin to nail down all of our donors, uh, small as well as medium. And then we have to reach out and begin to get volunteers to 
to help with all these different events. So that's kind of where we are. Is that it? <laughs> well, you know, no, this, this is just what the committee is suggesting. No, that's fantastic. Anybody, anybody in the city can throw their own. No, or do whatever, you know. no, that's fantastic. I jest a little bit there because that's that's a monumental task that's uh, being undertaken, and I think um, uh, I would assume that Main Street's going to assist in a lot of those. I mean, there's some joint projects there with Main Street. They, well, as far well they, they were when uh, Matt was here, yeah. that was no problem. Uh, Hopefully, uh, whoever they, they bring in uh, won't have any problem with it either. I'm sure the board, you know, right now is board, and they would be very supportive. So I'm not too concerned about that. Uh, just, I'm excited. I mean, I'm a history buff. And just hearing what you have for each month, I mean, if somebody truly wants to know the history about their community, it sounds like you guys have put it together a fascinating uh, a list of events that uh, uh, anybody goes through that whole process will truly know all about Medina. Um, two suggestions. Did you guys talk sure. about a, a time capsule at all? Yeah, yeah it so. has been discussed, and that's okay. certainly a possibility. We have the Bicentennial yeah, Commons. Uh, that might be a location for that. We've also put into the budget some kind of a monument, uh, some stone type of thing, to go in the Commons as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, time capsule. The, the only problem with those is you got to make sure you know where they're, where they're <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is I mentioned to Councilman Lamb. I have a, a request for council action, and that's probably almost two years old now. It has to do with putting uh, some sort of Medina on the city of Medina or something on a couple of our water towers that are exposed in the community. Right. And to me, it seems like a great opportunity, uh, and it does cost money, but a great opportunity to maybe, along those lines, put something up there that it talks about, you know, even it's just the dates of the 200-year bicentennial of 1818 to 2018, something along those lines that, I don't know if the committee would, would consider. I mean, I know it costs money, and you have a lot of funds already you need, but uh, you know, maybe it's something where we're doing work on the towers at that time for restoration of some sort that we can tie in something if there's equipment and uh, labor force already there that we can tie in something that uh, would show some, uh, and even next year, you know, something yeah. that gets people thinking, hey, we got a bicentennial coming up. And not only what you're doing, but. We, we have a pretty nice logo that we've got trademarked. Uh, uh, that might be something that would look really nice on the water towers. Uh, I, I had heard about this and I, I heard that Patrick had made an estimate. Um, yeah, yeah. A couple towers. Uh, the South Court Tower, maybe yeah. Lake Road. Um, some of the other ones are tucked in neighborhoods. Yeah, like I, I think those two would be Right. The best. And uh, they're about fat with seven to nine thousand each. Yeah, but I think those were, the one was continued, they were down there at the time. Well, so and that's what I'm figuring to build. If we could get the paint donated, Patrick, would that? Seem What's that? If we could get the paint donated, would that significantly reduce that? It would reduce it. Um, it's probably it's a labor. There's a lot of accidents. So I'm just throwing it out. Just sure. throwing it. Maybe something you guys on the committees can throw around if that's something you're interested in. That's so much. That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, let me just say one thing quick. Um, and Mark. You know, you exemplify. I think after you hear the, you know, what Roger went through, you probably, you probably speak for the entire community at, about being excited. You know, once you hear the plan, you know, I mean, and what could be more exciting than this? This is we're only going to do this one time. You know, once every hundred years. What a, what a great thing to be involved in that we have. Um, but you know, we're lucky that we have Roger Smalley. That he was chosen, yes, that he was chosen to run this because there's nobody more organized or who has a better background. You know, and, and my understanding was that that um, you know, we all know how important it was to have Roger organize this. And even if it wasn't the 200 years, we we probably have it anyway now, so we could get Roger uh, just to organize this <laughs> the 200 years. But Roger's done a great job, and that's really the reason all this has come about. So. Thank you. Bro. Yeah, thanks, Rod. Thanks for all your Thank effort you. and time. And I know it's just the beginning, but. Well, Got a good group of people on the committee. We appreciate all their help on, in addition to yours. So thank you for the update. Sure. And anytime you feel that things have uh, progressed more and you want to give a more uh, detailed update or uh, several updates as we go along, just let us know and okay. we'll be pleased to hear about it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.
Okay. All right, uh, 1662, we got a request for a track funding for State Route 18 corridor uh, improvement project. Patrick? Uh, thank you. Um, the mayor and I have been attending meetings with ODOT in um, Venati County and Venati and Montreal Township in regards to the State Route 18 project, which will go from <coughs> just west of Albert Drive all the way into Nettleton Road near I 71. Uh, the project uh, engineering is uh, I'm not complete, but I think getting there, uh, they've applied for funds to track, which is the big statewide group that awards large project funding for large projects twice, I believe, with fail both times. Their strategy this time, they think it would help their, their application tremendously if they got uh, some of the partners and then uh, local support in terms of commitments to fund the project. Uh, originally, they were asking approximately a million dollar commitment from the city. We didn't feel comfortable with it. We, we spoke about it at the Streets and Sidewalks Committee the other day, and they'd be getting lots of comment, but we're recommending a $250,000 commitment. Uh, this won't be due until at least 2020. That's assuming we get the funds this time around and there's no guarantee. So it's still a few few years out. Uh, the suggestion is that we can commit, every year we get Ohio Public Works Commission dollars. We can commit our local share to come from those dollars at that point in the future. Yeah, and, and basically what Pat summarized there is exactly what our committee decided on or voted to move to this committee. Uh, and using the, the, the issue one funds, uh, if it does pass through track, then that would be our, our contribution. As, as Pat uh, went over in, in the meeting, <coughs> the actual, the, the city would definitely benefit because they would reconstruct, there'd be no widening, but they would reconstruct uh, from Albert Drive uh, east to the city limits of Route 18. Now we've just had that done not too long ago within the last couple of years, but if you're looking another three, four, or five years out, uh, it, it probably would be need, needed to be done again. So that would be the share that, that would be benefiting the city. There'd be no widening actually in the city limits. So, uh, and we understood the, the financial commitment that the state wanted. We just didn't agree with the, the, the price that they were asking, the amount that they were asking. So, and again, where the, the funds would come from, whether we could set aside each year or uh, if, if it does come into fruition, that, that the, the $200,000 would, would uh, come out of the issue one fund so it would be used for dedicated dollars already. John? We met, uh, Patrick and I met this morning with Al Beal, who was a director of our district and went over to Summit County and now he's back in the private sector, but we were talking about this project in particular. He thought that the city could also leverage a, a greater percentage by counting the water lines or any infrastructure we do underneath that would, would not be pavement related like we do with most projects. So in, in this case, it's um, a little more than 10%, but if we add in the water lines, um, out of a $2 million project, it could be pushing closer to 20%. So um, he, he didn't see any uh, reason that we could not include any other um, ancillary costs that, that are required to get the project done. So we'll, keep, we'll keep that in mind and chase that as well. Questions? No, I mean, 2020 then we're looking at? At the earliest, that's if they get funding now. Well, this coming time around, and, and that being said, the application is due to track by the end of May. So, if we pass this at the next council meeting, we probably need university plus. Okay. Move to approve with the emergency clause. Second, including the emergency clause. Any further discussion or comment? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. 1663 fiscal year chip grant partnership agreement and CT consultants. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Coyne. Um, this is uh, the uh, um, agreement for the request by the mayor to authorize to direct and enter into a partnership agreement with the city of Brunswick, um, with the city of Medina, for the purpose of filing our chip at our uh, mutual chip application uh, for PY16. This allows for each community to get $400,000 out of it. So it'd be $800,000 $800, to be split among 
of various um, different programs, sub-programs within the CHIP program. This also would include the con contract agreement with uh, CT consultants to continue managing that as they have in, in previous years. Um, the City of Medina will be, again this year, the grantee for the purpose of the grant, so we would be managing all of the, the uh, finance and uh, distribution and payment of, of uh, and payment through the grant. So the emergency clause is requested so that the partnership agreement can be executed because the application for is the application for chip program is uh, May 6th. And this will also be on the city council agenda. Questions this evening. Um, under uh, and on, in the contract says where the city of Brunswick agrees to the following selection criteria. And one of those have to do with the homeowner um, and a, is essentially a, a lien on the property for five years. Is that correct? Uh, that they yes, have to so stay on it. That it has to be owner occupied yes. for five years, yeah, and if not, a, they have to repay. Yep. And this whoever in the city of Medina gets a, that grant has to follow that same. Correct. I believe we're not doing that in the city. I think it's just in the uh, in uh, in Brunswick. Okay, so please. somebody in the city can get the grant and then sell it in six months, and they don't have to repay. Is that how I read that, or? Um, we. Because I think in the past it was set up that way, and I, I maybe I didn't read it right, so I just that's why I was wondering. No, the 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 grantee through the home agreements that we had to recently do, and this applies that we had to basically um, agree to for those types of projects is um, could come back in the city, the the city of Medina could be responsible for it, even though it might be in the city of Brunswick. So, but those are very limited and it's as long as they keep it home occupied and those get any potential transfer is called up in a title search too. So so it can yes. be kiboshed before it could, could happen. Okay. So they have to repay that. The owner has to repay it okay. on the property. It's okay. their their within the city of Medina as well. So we we have we have the part of that activity is in the city of Medina as well. Okay. With this grant. And why did Brunswick or Wadsworth not do it with us? I, I can explain. That. Okay. Yeah. So we, I was approached by the. I was going to share that. I, I was approached by the um, county, and they ended up with the 350 instead of 400 last year because they didn't partner. The three cities partnered together, and their uh, question to me was, would the city of Medina object if they partnered with Wadsworth, and we partnered with the city? That way, it's another fifty thousand extra that's helping out the residents of the county. And I couldn't speak on behalf of Wadsworth, but I told them we would would not object to Wadsworth partnering with them. So in essence, um, they're gaining. Each of the cities is gaining an extra fifty thousand, and now now Medina County is gaining. So we all benefit from that. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, sir. And how's it been going so far administratively? The way we've been doing it. It's been working fine. I mean, we have several that have gone through, like the change order later on this agenda is part of a project in Brunswick, but it's being managed, and finances are being managed through the city, through guys that, as, with the city of Medina as, as the grantee. So it's been working well, it's been working the same as it has in past years. Um, so just, just to a larger scope, you know, because now we're dealing with Sandy Davis does a great job yeah, on this grant for us. Okay, questions? So, John, then why is the language different than for Brunswick? Language. Well, the language for you know Brunswick is kind of specifically broken out, and uh, and we are not. It, it it says you know Brunswick agrees to elect to choose the following finance mechanism. Uh, it's because they they have different programs within their there as a, the sub program within them is the what they determine they want to have as as the uh, as the the assistance and uh, items within their 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 city that they want to see have happen for them. So it's a little different than what we, the city of Medina, is having. But um, it's being administratively managed through the city of Medina. Okay. Questions? <coughs> you do approve with the emergency calls? Second, including the emergency calls. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Vote. Motion carries. Uh, 1664 amending CCF and a hospital and MCRC health and fitness agreement. That's right. This was actually pulled as an board earlier, so it's 
This is pulled. Okay. 1665, change order, fiscal year chip 3556, Jared, Gerald Boulevard, project. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. This is simply to add $770 to the um, to the purchase order for, to pay out for this private owner rehabilitation in, in the city of Brunswick. There were some change orders since it was since the original amount was over the maximum for for finance committee and ECO City Council to add the 770 to the previous 25,000, 26,000 and change. Um, and this one does also need a uh, emergency clause because it's completed and this is part of completing the payment to the contractor. Move to approve with the emergency clause. Second, including the emergency clause. Question. All in favor? Aye. 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 1666, copy of purchase. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Darren's passing out the, the proposal that we're recommending. We are, this started because we have three machines that are identical that are kind of the main copiers for the city, copier printers for the city. Um, one of them is in engineering. They're, they're identical. They're Rico MP5000s. The one in engineering um, we originally purchased used in 2011 from ACE, and it was in planning, and then in 2013 we flipped it, and the one that was in, engin in, uh, in engineering and planning got flat. The other two we bought new in 2008. We paid $16,440 for the pair. Um, one was in originally in finance, that's the one that's still in finance now, the other one was originally in engineering. We had a five-year maintenance agreement with Comdoc on the new ones. Um, Comdoc and RICO then split up and we had some difficulties with getting service because Comdoc couldn't get RICO parts. So when the service agreement ended in 13, we went to um, ACE, which is now a RICO dealer. Um, on all three of these machines, and that expires, that agreement expires coming up here pretty soon, which is where this started. So I talked to Darren, and we got some quotes. We're looking to buy three machines to replace six. So, and I'll kind of run through, we're replacing the three main ones. Um, those three have on them, the ones in planning and finance have a, um, a million one about in planning and a, and a little over a million on the one in finance. Then the one in engineering has a little under 700,000 copies on it. Um, that one's going to be sort of repurposed, moved to law department um, because it's a better machine than what they have and it'll be lower cost than what they have for the copies. So that's one that we're going to replace is law. Two of these uh, machines that we're asking for here are color, which will replace a color machine in planning and a color, and a color machine in engineering. The main reason for replacing the color one in planning is it's a lower volume unit and a higher cost unit. This will be cheaper. The one in engineering is that also. It's also ancient. It's a very old Xerox unit that we're not sure how long it has left, so we're going to replace it as well. Um, and then replacing the three main ones. Um, the proposal here is um, for one black and white, that'll be in finance and then two color machines, they'll be in planning and engineering, and they will service those, and the service agreement is um, 0.38, so a little under four tenths of a penny a page for black and white, and then 5.9 cents for color copies. Um, if you notice on the service agreement, we're agreeing to 300,000 copies a year, uh, black and white. We know that because we have counters on the machines we are we are using now, so we know that's within what we're going to do. Um, the color copies, Darren and I talked about that, and we're just really kind of taking a guess there because we don't have counters on the color machines we currently have, so we don't actually know how many color copies we're making, but this is significantly less per copy than what we're paying on the machines we have now. So whatever that number is, we're going to be saving by having um, a lower per unit cost, and they're better, I mean, they're higher volume machines. They're designed to be commercial machines where the color stuff we've had before has been uh, not as high volume of stuff because we didn't do as much color. Um, plus the technology has improved considerably on the color. If you're doing a document that has some color pages in it, um, years ago you either paid color for the whole document or not. So that's kind of cost prohibitive because you can see even now it's at six cents and four tenths of a penny a page. If you're paying color for an entire document where most of it's not, 
I mean, that's just not worthwhile. Now they are, the copiers are smart enough to figure that out, so they'll only charge you for color for the pages you actually have color on. Uh, and they'll still collate and staple the, the whole document together for you, so you don't have to go back and do that by hand. Um, looking to buy three at the same time, because we think we get a little better deal that way. Darren and I did talk to some other vendors and look at some other quotes. Um, none of them are as good on the per unit cost, but the other thing that's an advantage to ACE is that's who we're dealing with now. Talked to Darren at the beginning of this. Darren's comfortable working with them. And one of the units that we're replacing um, is the color unit planning, which they're giving us a credit for, which is more than half what we paid for it, which is obviously better than we do you know, at the auction. Um, so the proposal is three machines for $19,445. Uh, <coughs> replace the three where they are, plus the two color units and the one of the three that we're replacing we'll move over to law and replace an older machine there. That's the whole thing. I don't know what questions you have or... Well, that's plus the 1925 per year maintenance. How many copies do we make a year on one machine? Well, the, for example, the finance machine, and it's been in finance for the entire eight years that we've had it, has 1,013,000 as of, I printed this out, March 28th. So that one does close to 10,000 a month, um, give or take. Um, so we're a little over 100. The engineering machine, the one that's in engineering is a bit higher. It's hard to tell that here because we flipped them partway through to keep them, because it was the highest volume of planning was the lowest. So we flipped them so that we would wear them all out more evenly. Um, but I know it does more, so it's more than 120,000 a year, and then the planning one does a bit less. But the 300,000 a year, I mean, we're, we're using all of that. What about the two colors? Do we need two color printers, or do, they, do we use that many colors? Well, we have two now. We have one in planning, and we have the, the really old one in engineering. I think it's, you know, these things do quit every once in a while. We have a good service agreement, and they take care of them. But when they're not working, that's part of the reason for the second color is just because, OK, if the one in planning is down, you can print color in engineering or vice versa. Well, is that an additional $973 a month or a year? That is an additional $973 per year for up to 16,500 color copies. And like I said, I really don't. I mean, with the 300,000, with the 400,000 impressions a year, I mean, we know how much we do there. We don't know how much we do color because we don't have counters on those machines. They're old. You have no idea percentage-wise of what's being copied here annually as color? Any idea? Yeah, no, Not really. There, there were non-commercial grade color printers put in place years ago with no counters, no way to know. But we're going to be paying for the color copies now. And it's a lot more per, per yeah, print so now than what, what it's going to be on, on that. So I'll add this to it. If you're looking at that quote, one of the things I've done with all of the units citywide when we use copies is one is to bring it under one umbrella. Not only consolidate and try to bring them all together, but bring them under one umbrella. But I've been an advocate with the slightly used program. So if you notice here in bold, like the color one, the first unit, you can see what the state is brand new on it. Then you can see what they would sell us a brand new one for versus the used. So what we what we did with the color units was we opted for the used, which is a significant savings, almost $4,000 to do that. But the key to it is that you get a current model. So what we won't do is buy an old model just to have a significant savings because it will go end of life long before the eight to 10 years that we're making these things last. Mm -hmm. So we were able to do that with the color, but then the question becomes is why aren't we doing it with the black and white? So I just wanted to point out the reason we're not doing it with that is it is the used one would be an older model. And for the $2,000 difference between an older and a newer model, we would significantly probably run that out of end of life before we got to our million copies. Our general longevity is to try to get a million out of these things. If we can get over a million, we're doing good, but we're dealing with some maintenance issues with two of these three because we're running them to end of life and the parts are now starting to become more difficult to get because they are eight to ten years old. Do we need two color copiers? Yes. And and for the price, that, that's part of the factor. The factor is that even if we went and bought another with black and white, it would be more money than it would be this color one. And this color one used gives us a backup on the network. So when they fail, which is what we currently have in place. I think you just answered my next question. They are networked. All yes. Okay, so the, somebody in planning can use the one in engineering. Yep. Right. Okay. And we, we set them up so that when you, like with the scanning and stuff, the scanning's all set up on all three of them. So if, if the, you know, obviously I usually use the one in finance, but if it's down, when I walk over to engineering, 
it has my information to do a scan. If I print something there, it, it does all the stuff the same way. So there's no, other than having to walk across a building, there's not a delay on, on a machine being down. And the other thing I think I neglected to point out, they usually want to do a three-year agreement, and Darren and I talked to them, and we wanted five. The, the reason is because the way the service agreement works is the machines get older, they want to charge you more, obviously, because it's an older machine. So the longer you can lock in the initial um, service agreement, the, the longer you get that price. This is for a five-year uh, service agreement at these prices. Well, I, I'm impressed how long you've kept the uh, other ones functioning, and I think it's long overdue. And yeah, the other thing is that he mentioned that law department has a really old unit that we moved from police records. Mm -hmm. uh, it's supported by a company that's not Ace Management, so it's one that it's kind of giving them a hard time. We're having another support vendor involved. We're going to try to bring it under one umbrella, and, and the one that we can rotate over there will be a better fit for them for now. Thank you. In, in your reacquired machine, uh, do they rehab them, rehab them with new parts before they put them out in the field? Or yeah, well, that? their position is it depends on how many miles they got on them, if you will. So if they're low-volume machines that they had, they'll bring them in, they're fully supported right out of the box, so if, and they are for the term of five years. So if there's anything that goes wrong with them, there's no expense to us. So can Huber print off his iPad if he wanted to? No. <laughs> He would be able to. I could probably do it for him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just check. I know he wants to get up in technology. And try to make sure All right, thank, thank you. you. Any other questions? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 1667 bids for Westmouth Road reconstruction, city job number 818. Patrick? Thank you. Um, this is Westmouth. It's actually phase one. This one was started long before we. At the phase two, which was completed two years ago. Now, we finally, as council knows, finished the right away acquisition, and now we're moving forward with ODOT. Uh, we've submitted everything to them and anticipate getting their clearance. Go ahead and bid the projects uh, here in the next several weeks. Uh, so we want to give this to you. Um, we have a, a goal from ODOT to have it bid and awarded by June 30th. The project is uh, $3.6 million, a little over $3.6 million. Will be our largest street project that we've ever done. Um, that does include uh, monies for replacing the water lines, storm sewer, uh, some sidewalk, and whatnot. Um, we do have two different grants for the project. There's a federal grant, which is why ODOT is tied into it, uh, 742500 And our issue, we mentioned the old PWC, the issue one money is uh, 406000 for that. Asking permission to go ahead and bid and award the project. Questions? Have you coordinated with the fair? Because it's going to be construction. There are fairly. specific uh, language in the uh, project documents that you cannot interrupt with the fair. And actually, the way it's, you know, we're going to bid in, in June, award in June. They won't start until the fall. Uh, they have contractor to bid, do the underground over the fall and winter. And the completion date is uh, two weeks before the fair. So I don't think there will be any interference. Okay. Is this being taped? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Motion approved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Uh, 1668 bids for the 2016 concrete street repair city job 1021. Thank you. This is our annual uh, street repair project where we uh, repair uh, individual slabs of pavement uh, in various areas throughout the city. Questions? Do you have the list? Yeah. Uh, we'll have it and email it to everyone before the uh, Council before the end of the week. Before the, thank you. <coughs> Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 1669 Mending Ordinance 1215 Friends at a Cemetery Lease Agreement. Mr. Worley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we would like to amend Ordinance 12 15, which is the building project agreement and the lease <coughs> agreement uh, that we entered into with the Friends of the Cemetery prior to the construction of the, the uh, new building at Spring Grove. Uh, specifically Exhibit B, which is the lease agreement. Um, when the friends were trying to obtain the necessary insurance requirements um, as per the original lease, ran into some issues. Um, Mr. Huber could probably elaborate better uh, on the changes to the language. Um, but we did change Article 14, the indemnity and insurance, uh, to better meet their uh, requirements and also reformatted the lease so it could be formal so it could be submitted to the Medina County Recorder. 
uh, emergency clauses requested uh, so that we can they can move forward with ensuring uh, the building as soon as possible. Mr. Huber, would you like to explain the change of the indemnity that was unreasonable? The clause that we took out required the Friends of the Cemetery to indemnify the City of Medina for negligence caused by City of Medina's own employees, which is a reasonable request. There are situations in our contracts where we do require that and have, but in this situation it's not required and it is reasonable to take that clause out. So we don't want to be overbearing. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure the law department's position on this. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Move okay. to approve with the emergency clause. Second, including the emergency clause. All in favor? Aye. All motion carries. 1670, construct a six foot wide sidewalk along Ryan Road. We have visitors today, but Patrick, this is yours. Sure. Um, yeah, as council might remember, when we were planning the Ryan Road project, there was a desire to install a four-foot sidewalk on the east side of the road, the city, predominantly city side. Uh, to do that, we went out and acquired easements from 20-some property owners, uh, and that is part of the plans that is scheduled to be built shortly uh, in the next several weeks. Subsequent to that, I was approached by Medina County Bicycle Committee, uh, Tony Redman, to hear now and asked if the city would be interested in, in lieu of the four-foot sidewalk, installing a 10-foot multi-purpose path. Uh, that wasn't feasible on our end, that we, that we already had our water line in, it was an overload, there was a lot of issues, and it just wasn't prudent. Uh, so the mayor and I discussed it, and then talked to Tony, and came up with the idea of a six-foot wide sidewalk. Uh, Tony felt it was that would be very valuable and benefit to their group. Uh, so we went and priced that out. You can see the cost of the uh, additional two foot increase from four to six foot is about $39,000 on top of the $49,700 that is budgeted for the four foot side. Um, we do are getting grant monies for this. Uh, we do have some money available in our original appropriation. Uh, the city would end up plan paying about $21,000. $400 out of that $39,000, the rest would be co covered by grant monies if we wanted to go ahead with this. Uh, let me ask you a quick question. Are easements, they're not specific about what we're putting in there, is it? Uh, it does say sidewalk. Doesn't say the width or anything? It does not. It says sidewalk. Now, when you say sidewalk, does that mean concrete? Or are you talking here, this is concrete and not asphalt? Concrete as well, yeah. And you uh, advise against asphalt? Pardon me? You would advise against using asphalt rather than... Concrete? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, most of our sidewalks, all of our sidewalks are concrete. Um, that's what we planned here. Uh, there traditionally hasn't been a big saving, cost savings between the two. Um, and we think that the concrete, if it's built correctly, will last longer. It used to be, Mark, but as the oil oil prices have gone up, so has the cost of asphalt. It's now been pretty comparable. Okay. Well, it was back down a little bit. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. Um, yeah now, this will run, will this run all the way to Sturbridge? Well, that, I was going to introduce, uh, well, I uh, asked uh, Tony and uh, Tim Swanson from Atlanta County Parks, who's also part of the group, to come to the meeting, um, and they could explain why this is important, why it's a benefit, more of the details. Well, that's what I'm getting at, is because the um, rail trail dumps out, forgive me, it's White Cliff. Okay. Off of Ryan Road. Right. And, but you still have a, a, a vacant area that comes all the way up to Sturbridge. I mean, yes. And there's no talks about extending it that far, correct? There are still talks. Oh, okay. Because, yes. I mean, and we've talked about with Nowaka and putting a, uh, a bike lane down Court Street. And I don't want to throw a fork in everything, but to me, it'd be great to have that Ryan Road or that trail I'm talking about tie into this Ryan Road path that ties into Lafayette Road that definitely needs help with uh, sidewalk and uh, pedestrian improvement and somehow if we could get all that to eventually tie together that'd be wonderful. So that's all. Awesome. But I'll let you. That was well said. <laughs> Thank you Mr. President. Um, if I could, 
Patrick, does that path, would that go down to Sturbridge? Would it go over yeah, the river? Well, we got there, there's a, at either end, there's a 150 or so feet of sidewalk, Lafayette to the south, and those apartments, and then Sturbridge north to the uh, railroad crossing. That 39,000 I mentioned would replace those four foot sidewalks with six foot, so it would be six foot all the way from Sturbridge to Lafayette. Okay. Yeah. Um, just uh, the background, thank you for the introduction. Uh, this is Tony Radicek. We are part of the uh, Medina County Bicycle Transportation Task Force. Uh, so this evening, that's why we're here. Um, and the task force is supported by the, the Medina County Parks, um, Century Cycles, and of course, Medina City Parks and Recreation, as well as other county agencies. Um, but uh, like Councilman Colasar was saying, uh, the task force members, we became united like November. And certainly, um, the Medina County Bike and Hike Trails has been around since 2000. And I, I put a map uh, of a, a master plan uh, that the Park District, it, it was a countywide plan, and it was concept for an assortment of types of paths. It was multi-use paths and also bicycle routes. Bicycle routes uh, would be explained as riding on the infrastructure of a road, but they would be having either the bicycle lane marked on the road or with signs. And so Tony uh, Radicek did a countywide bicycle route plan. It's approved by NOACA. No, by the commissioners. By the commissioners. Um, and so when, we, when the task force got together, we saw this Ryan Road project exactly like Councilman Kolasar was saying. It's a connector to a spur to a transportation route, a bicycle transportation route that will have signs on it. And so that's a north-south corridor um, that brings you down through the center of town and then it does a jog on 42 and then it goes down Ryan Road. And that's when we saw this, this work that the city was doing. And so we're thinking a, a four foot wide sidewalk uh, certainly is, is better than no sidewalk, um, but but certainly when you have multi-use with two bicycles going side by side or someone pushing a stroller and a bicycle or a pedestrian, four foot seems to be too narrow. Um, the only other time the city really did a, an asphalt walk instead of a sidewalk or an, an asphalt trail was recently with the Champion Creek uh, extension uh, right there on Springbrook. There, there was an existing concrete four foot wide sidewalk uh, the grant that uh, the city obtained paid for a 10 foot wide paved um, multi-use path and that is right next to the curb um, and so that goes along that spring brook and then takes you into uh, Sam Massey and so this 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 is a connector that the task force goal was to identify these small connectors that could have significant impacts to future connections or to connections that are already there um, as a side note, I will say that the Park District is already planning to build uh, a several hundred thousand dollar trail. It would be a ten foot wide trail. Um, it would be called Montville Trails and it's, it would be the spur directly below Halifax Lane. Uh, so, you know, on, uh, off of Route 3 South, there's that Green Ash Trail. We would, we would pour a trail from Green Ash Trail and it would connect uh, to a road that would cross over Ryan Road and Wycliffe so that you could get to the Chippewa Inlet Trail, uh, Rail Trail. So this, this is a small project or a small connector, but the, the significant um, that we feel that it has uh, for the county, we felt it was important to, to bring it to you guys. Uh, this is the first I'm hearing the cost. Uh, so um, we were contemplating uh, what would be the cost of a six foot wide asphalt path versus a four foot wide concrete sidewalk? Um, so that's what we were putting in for you. Your contemplation was what number? Do you have any numbers for that? No, I, um, I don't. Patrick, is there, would there be any benefit or is the cost going to be first to the same? And what does this loan mean? Does that mean it's an interest fee loan or does that mean we pay Correct. back? We, uh, for that project, uh, we did get a grant. And we did take out a loan. Um, I forget the exact split, but we have both that it is zero percent loan. 
And this is award one. How much money do you have? No, it's award four. Oh, it's award four. four. Oh, how much money do you have? I'm going to know. Open space? Yeah. How much? Thousand? Yeah. You're going to use it. You have anybody left in yours? No, no but Brian does. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, used the rest of mine for the last connection of the Champion Creek, I believe. Um, but I have a question. If, I know it's 0%, but I mean, it shows that we still have 75,800 available. That's left well allocated over. from council. And that's 75,000, okay. you know. When you pass and give us an authorization to bid, it's a certain percentage of the city one away funds and a certain percentage of the grant, a certain percentage of the loan. So 75,000 is really off the total, you know, the total of all three of those funding solutions. Okay. And Pat, just let me clarify one more time then, from Sturbridge to Lafayette is where the four foot was planned? Correct. Well, our plan was just to connect, you know, there's existing 100, 150 foot sidewalks on either end. We were just going to connect that four foot in the middle. Okay. Uh, what, we're what these numbers show is taking out that existing four foot and putting six foot down. And, and the existing is there's part of it's already existing on the Lafayette end and part on the Sturbridge <coughs> end? Correct, yeah. Okay. Tim, that uh, spur you said down off of uh, Halifax. Yes. Now that goes from the Ryan Trail, or the, uh, what is the official term the for that? Development. The That rail trail, what's your, what, the one that crosses? The Chippewa Rail Trail. Well, okay. Now, that spur will go off of there into that development, across Ryan into the development on the other side, is that correct? And then connect to the, uh, yeah, uh, root neighborhoods. Is that yeah, all of them. And it'll end right there, correct? Yes. Okay. But to be clear, that the trail, the paved multi-purpose trail would end at the concrete road in the subdivision east east of Ryan Road. Okay. That's up that street. Right. Then you would use you would use the the road there. Right. Right. That's but existing. They're back back yes. roads, if you will. They're yeah. not on main. Yeah. They're main it's state a dead roads. end. Right. It's, it's a, and then there's a direct shot to Wycliffe, right directly across from that. So I mean, just, I, just for clarification, yeah. though, um, there there's a proposal with the state of Ohio now for some housing credits to develop behind Waterbury on the north side of High Point, <coughs> and MMHA submitted that application <coughs> and has already agreed to take the bike path through that portion. <laughs> We still have to work with the ACME once it gets developed, but then our NOACA grant gets us to Sturbridge. So the piece we would be missing is if we can get the ACME property to connect to theirs, then from Sturbridge um, to, to the north side of the ACME property. Um, we would probably come back to council <coughs> and ask to put a, a widened path just to get into the private property there. And we're, we're hopeful that they'll let us come through the Acme property, through some of their green space there, create a walking trail, um, connect to this housing unit onto the south side of Waterbury, which will then lead into this path that they're bringing over from Ryan Road. Mm -hmm. So that would literally connect our Champion Creek Trail all the way to the Chippewa Trail and back. Now how's the Champion Creek Trail connect? Well, because this Nowaka brings because us the bike uh, lane Court, yeah, the, the yeah. bike lanes on Court Street, um, and then across Smith to the trail on South Broadway. I'm, I'm just going to speak freely. I've never <laughs> been a fan of the bike um, lane on South Court. So, I mean, as a biker, it's and using that street. I know we've been working on it for a while, but uh, I'm just trying to see how we can keep people off the road. And you know, well, here grant we accept it. Right. So. Right, we can give the grant money back, but right now it's it's better than what we have. So I'm just looking at different avenues and making that connection to the Chippewa Inlet Trail. It's huge, and, um, and, and you you did mention AI route that um, you know we felt too the the residents, Fort Smith, um, Ryan Road could ride their bikes and get to the middle school as well with this with this path. Uh, uh, Bill, question. No, no, I'm good. I, 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 I'm in. I think in agreement. I like the idea of wider sidewalks as a as a general rule. I know handicapped associations 
you know, all recommend, and I know we can't do it with the easements, but four foot sidewalks are, are really difficult for the handicapped folks. Mm -hmm. And particularly in a lot of sections of towns, the sidewalks aren't four feet wide anyway because they're completely overgrown. Mm -hmm. And a six foot sidewalk, you can walk next to each other, let alone have a great bike path. Um, no, my, no, my only comment is I'd like, you know, I would, I would like to go out and take a look at it myself and, um, and, and um, bring it back at the next meeting if you're amenable to that. Well, I mean, it's going to be additional funding if we want to do it, so I, mean, I think this is the first time I've heard of it, so maybe go out and look at it and come back to the next meeting and make a determination what you want to do. I'm good with that. There it is. No question for the mayor. Is, is there any, and I'm just going to throw this out there, is there any chance, let's say, we do find a better alternative to connect Champion Creek and maybe with this or something, is there any way that NOACA would still, because we're improving our uh, foot traffic or, you know what I mean, our, our bike and walking alternatives, would they allow us to move, let's say we decide Southport's not the best route, we look at some other area to connect Champion Creek to the Chippewa. Would, do you have any idea if they would say, hey, okay, you well, can move it over or no? I can't, I can't speak for NOACA. I, I can tell you that, that Part of this grant was to do streetscape enhancements along the, uh, the Methodist Church property, water retention, um, and, and uh, controlled uh, release of those waters, and then the, the bike lanes down South Court Street from Sturbridge to there. So um, it, it's, not a, it's not as simple as just changing the route of the bike lanes. Uh, I mean, part of this was with the vision and the goal of connecting because we knew that Redwood had already donated land. We knew we had in the works the um, housing complex, you know, so we, we were just putting these pieces together. Now, that's not to say that, you know, we put the bike lanes in on South Court Street um, and, you know, years down the road we decide to widen the sidewalks or, or find an alternative route. Um, I'm not opposed to it, but I don't, I don't think we can just take that one piece out of the grant without losing the entire grant. Just something to think about. I mean, if we're going to take time to take a look at it. Keep up in mind, see what so, um, Tim, I think that uh, we're going to look at that because you're requesting there's going to be an additional 21500 from the city. Um, or I guess an estimate cost thirty nine thousand total, but the grant will cover seventeen and a half thousand of that. So, okay. you guys can look at the existing sidewalk that'll be have to be modified in a new portion of the, of course, new. It, you know, and and I know that we only do concrete in in the city, but can we get a price on? Mm -hmm. Can we get a price on the difference between concrete and asphalt? Sure. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for Thank the information. Uh, 1671, amending planning and zoning code, various tax amendments. John. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is a, a recommendation from the Planning Commission at the April 14th meeting for various tax amendments. Uh, this had originally gone to them uh, in January of this, of this year. These pieces were tabled for further review. Um, and these are mainly deal with um, heavy manufacturing, light manufacturing definitions in the zoning code, and then some changes to the um, permitted, the conditionally permitted use tape uh, regulations and the actual <coughs> R I one zoning district use tables. Um, the as is this attached to the uh, R C A. This is being submitted to basically. Get it. The planning commission said, "Let's get this onto the books, so it's better than the regulations that we have, in particular in relation to the definitions for heavy and light manufacturing." And they want to continue looking at it, you know, as as it goes through the city council uh, review process. Um, so these are uh, coming to you as a um, text amendment requires public hearing in front of the plan, uh, city council. So public hearing notice date would be between basically tomorrow and May 26th with an anticipated City Council public hearing on June 13th to keep it going through the process. Mr. Ro why did uh, Mar uh, Bruce Gold vote no? Uh, his basic objection was that he felt that this was uh, too general, that it could bring about some uh, 
unnecessary litigation when people would say walk by uh, a light manufacturing and see some smoke inside that's part of a welding process um, or uh, hear some noise that's you know he's on the other side of the street and hear some noise that people may may find it offensive um, uh, those were his biggest complaints and as a small business owner his concerns were this could impact him with it um, I've noticed that, um, and I don't know if this is related to it, but the parcel on the corner of Abbeville and 18 is for sale. Do we, I guess, are we okay with possibility what can go there based upon previous history? Oh, it's a separate related, unrelated item. Kind of unrelated, but I'm just wondering because that um, we went through a lot of I, You know, I think it's zoned, it's zoned C3, I believe, uh, which is our most intensive commercial zoning district. It does have very strict requirements for buffering when you're adjacent to residentially zoned properties. Um, it's not terribly large, so there's not much more than maybe a small six to 8,000 square foot retail building could be built there. Um, and I do know that in the past there was concerns about proposals right. on that site, commercial proposals. Uh, it's been zoned that I think since the whole subdiv greater subdivision was created. Right. And, um, I think we talked about that probably about six to eight years ago when we had the issue come up of what, what's going to happen there in the future again, we should address it. So just so everybody's aware, another retail establishment could go there and we could have a packed house. No. <laughs> Is it from the residential uh, neighborhood there all the way up to Abbeville's for sale? Is that? Yeah, that corner. Is that block? Uh, you know, the block that was used to be before it got clear cut, let's call it. Remember years ago they cut all the trees down? Mm -hmm. right. That so corner. Yorktown? Yorktown. Uh, no, it's next, it's the next street over at Abbeville. Right, you have right. Yorktown, that's, well, that's where we and then you have, issue, right, the, issue issue the next same well, block. Well, that's, I'm just clarifying, but the yeah. issue before was... Yorktown right. in 18, this is Abbeville right. 18. Same kind of issues that'll pop up, I would imagine. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I, I don't know the details on that one. I know the one at Yorktown is what I was referring yeah, York, but this is the well, this is the, another corner they're, that's for sale. They're, they're commercially zoned as well. Yeah, they have a actively signs up. I mean, there's active sign up and for sale, so I'm sure yeah. it could come back. A nice place for a park right there in Yorktown with open space. On. <laughs> there is the argument to be made that you know having small services, um, retail services in proximity, isn't detrimental to residential area. As well, well so this one was. When we came, <laughs> well, this the, is a very the big price uprising. point of a, of a retailer is not necessarily a zoning issue, unfortunately. In I understand. Cases, so. And the Yorktown one, if I remember correctly, it would go over. Yeah. one of the biggest contentions was the drive, uh, egress, yeah, the, the entrance to the, the business was going to be off Yorktown, right. and that was the biggest concern about the, the residents, right? No, I'm just bringing it up again because it could come back. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, but this is, I don't, we're not going to vote anything like because we have a public hearing, I would imagine, so if there's things change. It's, yeah, public hearing theoretically on June 13th. Okay, good. Okay with that. Any, any questions for Jonathan on this? Uh, I just want to thank you for doing this work, Jonathan. Uh, it, it's moving us in the right direction. <clears throat> My only concern with this was uh, what it was addressing. Uh, I, concrete crushing, I don't know that is really in the uh, scope of heavy manufacturing or light manufacturing um, you know maybe we want to also look at maybe recycling or something like that and how that might fit into this as well it is, as I said at the planning commission meeting there was there's other avenues as well you know mm -hmm. going from umbrella <coughs> definitions to very specific business slash use definitions as well to kind of maybe just target point on something but as a as an example, these te these text these uh, definitions needed would have needed work anyway. So you know that's something that you know provide a little more specificity to these. But there are potentially other avenues, and that's what we'll be discussing mm -hmm. the planning commission at the next meeting. Because I know if we make it too specific, we open up just as big a can of worms. Too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, Sixteen seventy two expenditure of fifteen thousand for commercial fitness solutions MCRC. That's right. Thank you, Mr. President. The reason this is here today is uh, because we usually purchase different pieces of equipment from different vendors. In this case, Commercial uh, Fitness Solutions has all the pieces we need this year that we're going to replace and purchase, and they give safe pricing. Uh, 
we usually see at City Hall or fire can use the old pieces you know, in the workout rooms or um, in this case these pieces are original equipment, hard to get parts for and just not worth it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go ahead and give that, have that company give us credit for these in front of me. Question? Would you approve? Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. 1672 Bicentennial Grave Pavers. Thank you, Mr. Yes, President. Um, a couple, uh, about a month ago now, we installed the engraved pavers at the Bicentennial Commons. And ever since we installed them, we've been getting a uh, large amount of phone calls, people inquiring about purchasing a brick. Um, we did sell them for a little over a year and a half, um, almost two years. So we uh, kicked around the idea, I discussed it with Uptown Park Advisory Committee first about doing a third round, um, checked with Keith. If we did do a third round of sales, um, since we don't need any more funds for the improvement of the Bicentennial Commons, uh, discussed the proceeds going to the Bicentennial Committee um, since it kind of linked uh, back to that park. Uh, Keith mentioned that as long as we passed an ordinance uh, authorizing the funds and the proceeds after the installation to go to the committee uh, that we could do so. I know Roger discussed it um, with the committee. I believe they're in favor of it. Um, and I think with the proper promotion, um, there's definitely interest there. We have 210 available bricks. Um, currently, there's 153 4 by 8 bricks installed and 43 8 by 8 bricks. Uh, we were selling the four by eights for around a hundred dollars, and uh, corporate brick for two fifty, and eight by eight for five hundred. So there's definitely um, interest there, and there's definitely money to be made. And I think it would benefit uh, the committee if we opened it up to a third round. Talked with the uh, contractor that installed the bricks; um, they can be removed relatively easily um, and replaced in a timely fashion. So I'm recommending that we. Bill, no. question? No, I, I think it's I think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. We did. I think we gave twenty five hundred dollars to the bicentennial committee, but this is a great way to raise funds without really, you know, we're not taking money. You know, the general fund. But this is a and, and there's a I think a great um, there's a lot of interest. You know, in chances that a lot of people are really um, I think like the bricks that were put in and. Folks who want to participate but didn't, you know, take the chance, take the opportunity to do it earlier. It'd be a great way for the bicentennial committee to get a, get a, um, um, some funds in place, so, you know, as we move forward. Do we have a limit on the number we can sell? Yeah, two hundred and ten four by eight. That's that, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Unless you take a grass. So what if they? Well, well. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thought maybe put some bricks up here at City Hall or something. All right. Any questions? Move to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, the last item we have before we go into executive session, anybody? Anything else to come before finance? No. Nope. Okay. We have to make a uh, motion to go enter into executive session at 714 for two purposes. One is to consider the employment of a public employee or official, and the second is for preparing, conducting, or reviewing negotiations or bargaining sessions with employees concerning their compensation or other terms and conditions of their employment. Second, Mr. Huber. Mr. Huber will attend, and who else we need? That's it, Mr. Huber. Want me. And the mayor, maybe. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, call the roll, please. <coughs> Lamb? Yes. Hubbard? Yes. Shields? Yes. Coyne? Yes. Simpson? Yes. Rose? Yes. Yes. We will recess uh, into executive session and we'll come out of executive session but take no action on any item in executive session and then we'll adjourn the meeting and go to the council. So we're in recess. <laughs>